Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Tomorrow, President Biden will travel to areas impacted by the recent extreme weather in California. Stops include the Santa Clara and Santa Cruz counties, where storms have caused severe floods and landslides. During these stops, the President will meet with first responders, state and local officials, and communities impacted by the devastation, survey recovery efforts, and assess what additional federal support is needed. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell will travel with the President, and while in California, the President will be joined by Governor Newsom and other elected officials. The President has been closely monitoring the situation in California over the past several weeks and is being regularly briefed by his Homeland Security team. Throughout this time, he has remained in close touch with the Governor and also local officials on the ground. As you all saw, President Biden approved Governor Newsom's request for an expedited major disaster declaration Saturday evening, providing federal support for debris removal, emergency protective measures, and individual assistance to survey whose homes have been damaged or destroyed by the storm. And we have over 500 FEMA and other federal personnel have already deployed to California to support response and recovery operations and are working side by side with the state to ensure all needs are indeed met on the ground. This Sunday, the White House will commemorate what would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Vice President Harris will travel to Florida to deliver a major address on the fight for women across America to have access to reproductive care and make their own health care decisions. Fifty years after the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade, ultra-MAGA Republican officials continue to push at all levels of government for extreme legislation rolling back women's fundamental rights, including a national abortion ban. At the state level, more than 60 anti-choice bills have been produced for the 2023 legislative session, including extreme proposals going as far as threatening women with felony charges for accessing care. In stark contrast, the President and the Vice President remain committed to fighting these extreme attacks on women and expanding access to reproductive care however they possibly can. This Sunday, the President will speak about the fight to secure women's fundamental right to reproductive health care in the face of these attacks. She will talk about what's at stake for millions of women across the country and, most importantly, the need for Congress to codify prote the protections of Roe into law. The President and the Vice President uh, and a strong majority of the American people believe that women must be empowered to make decisions about their own lives and health care, and that those decisions should not, should never be, should not be politicized or second-guessed by politicians. Unfortunately, that is exactly what Republican officials are doing in Congress. Despite the outcome of the midterm elections in which millions of Americans went to the polls just across the country to protect women's constitutional rights and reject extreme proposal to sell out the middle class, we have seen House Republicans abuse their narrow majority to take aim at the very issues the American people care about the most. In addition to attacking women's health care, we've already seen House Republicans try and undercut the progress President Biden has made rebuilding the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. Today, we, get, we got our news of even more progress tackling inflation, bringing costs down for Americans. Both producer and consumer inflation has, fallen, uh, has now fallen for about six months straight. And consumer spending remains strong with retail sales in December about flat when adjusted for inflation. That adds up to historic progress. President Biden inherited an economic crisis and turned it into the strongest two years of job growth on record. The United States just hit the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years because of his economic plan. Again, his economic plan for the American people is indeed working. But as President is fighting, as he is fighting to bring costs down more and ensure that middle class families get a fair shake, House Republicans are advancing an economic plan that will take tax cuts for the rich, 
higher prices and cutting social media, uh, pardon me, cutting social, show, social security and cutting Medicare as well. Their very first vote of the new Congress was a bill to worsen inflation and tax welfare for the rich. They want to impose an unprecedented tax increase on middle class families in the form of a 23% sales tax in order to provide even more tax giveaways to the super rich and big corporations. They're going to vote to raise gas prices and deprive Americans of relief at the pump, and they're threatening to kill millions of jobs and, and 401k plans by trying to hold the debt limit hostage unless they can, again, cut Social Security, cut Medicare, cut Medicaid. So on this last point, the President has been clear. He will not allow Republicans to take the economy hostage or make, make, make working Americans pay the price for their schemes to benefit the wealthiest Americans and also special interest. With that, I say this all the time, Josh, I haven't yeah. seen you in a long time. <laughs> Good and you always you. tell me you've been here. Okay, hi. Right. Good to see you, Josh. Go ahead. Um, Kick us off, please. Given everything you just laid out with regard to House Republicans, what has the White House seen or heard from House Republicans that gives you confidence that we can avoid a default? Look, we've been very, very clear, and I'll say this again. Um, let me first say, let me first say this part, that um, after after the midterm elections, the president was very clear. After we saw a historic, uh, kind of a historic, um, uh, uh, historic uh, when it comes to a Democratic president in the, in 60 years being able uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, have a successful midterm. When you look at uh, what we saw in the Senate and we look at the red wave that never happened, uh, the president said. You know, the, the American people spoke very loudly and very clearly. They want to see us work in a bipartisan way. So the president is, is wants to do that. He's looking to do that. But also, when you think about the debt limit, it is, uh, you know, we've been very clear. Uh, the debt limit has been something that has happened three times, if you look at just the last administration, in a bipartisan way. It is something that should be that should be done without conditions. There should be we should not be negotiating around it. Uh, it is the it is the duty, the basic duty of Congress to get that done. And so we're not going to uh, we're just not going to negotiate uh, about that because again it was done under the last president. Uh, it was done uh, three times again in a bipartisan par bipartisan way. This is there is no alternative to Congress. Uh, responsibility here to address uh, the debt ceiling. Uh, Treasury makes millions of payments each day. Their system is built to pay our country's bills on time. It's not set to make the United States delinquent by paying our bills. There is a reason that Treasury secretaries of both parties, if you think about it and if you all remember, rejected uh, this incredible risky and dangerous idea that has never been tried before. So it is essential for Congress to recognize that dealing with the debt ceiling is their constitutional responsibility. This is an easy one. This is something that should be happening without conditions. Just to make sure I understand, do you think House Republicans in this Congress see their responsibilities the way that you just outlined. They should. I just laid out why they should. They should have the. They should feel the responsibility. And I talked about this yesterday. I quoted the Chamber of Commerce said it would have catastrophic economic consequences. A former economist to Republican senators Rob Portman, Mark, Marco Rubio, Mitt Romney called it a really bad idea, and disaster. And in 2011, then Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner called it unworkable and harmful. It is, uh, it is, the precedent has been for both parties to come together and to get this done. Uh, we are talking about uh, the, the, full, the full faith and credit uh, of our country. And then secondly, real fast, um, help us understand, given the frequency with which President Biden works in Delaware, what is the case against having visitor logs for his house? So I'm... I am going to refer you to my white, the White House counsel. They actually addressed this. They answered this question uh, that you are asking me, I believe, on Sunday. And I also believe the Secret Service put out a statement. So I would refer you uh, to those two statements that, uh, that came out uh, from, from the White House. 
Uh, I'm actually going to go around. I got a, a, a lovely letter from Tam, Tam, Tamara Keith, your, your president of the White House uh, Correspondents uh, Association, and she asked that I go around, so I'm going to do that. Go ahead, Courtney. Thanks, Kareem. I wanted to ask about the FAA issue last week with the ground stop that was called at airports across the country. When is the president expecting to receive an after-action report? So as DOT said, uh, the issue was a damage that database file with no evidence of a cyber attack. So I want to be very clear about this. And you heard, uh, you heard Secretary Buttigieg say that there is going to be an after uh, uh, action report. I don't have a timeline for you to share from here. I would refer you to the Department of Transportation. But this is something that we obviously take very seriously uh, when it comes to the safety of Americans. That is something who are flying, which is something that we uh, make a priority. Uh, when the timeline of the uh, action report, I would uh, go. I would refer to the Department of Transportation. Also, this year Congress will have to reauthorize funding for the FAA. Is there anything that the president wants to see specifically in that bill that pertains to what happened last week? Again, that's something. Uh, as I mentioned last week, that happens every five years. We're up. This is the time that uh, uh, that we're going to see Congress act on this. Don't have anything to share on specifics. Again, as you know, this is something. As I just mentioned, when it comes to the safety of American people, this is something that is a priority for us. We want to get to the bottom uh, of what occurred uh, uh, just days ago, not too long ago. I don't have any specifics on the, the action that Congress is going to take. I'm going to go wait to the back. Go ahead. Uh, Wes? Uh, Owen, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's my bad. Sorry, Owen. Hi, Corinne. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'd like to turn your attention to Nigeria. Uh, just a few days ago, an absolutely horrific story. A Catholic priest in his rectory early Sunday morning was literally burned to death. Bandits burned the rectory. And uh, today, as a matter of fact, Pope Francis asked the world to pray for Father Isaac Achi. Question one, two questions here. One. Will the Biden administration forcefully condemn acts of violence against Christians in Nigeria? So let me just say we are saddened by the senseless killing. Uh, the, we have seen the reports, and we certainly are saddened by that. We are monitoring the situation uh, as information develops. And so we hope the Nigerian authorities will quickly bring the perpetrators uh, to justice. And of course, we uh, condemn violence uh, of any kind. Uh, and so that is something that you've heard me say many times from this podium, and that is something that we will continue to condemn. And just to follow up on that, how many more Nigerian priests have to be so brutally murdered before Nigeria is placed back on the countries of particular concern list, you know, the State Department's list? Mm -hmm. That is something I would refer you to the State Department about, that particular list. Go ahead, Niles. Niles. Thank, thank you. Uh, on the, the, this question that was, um, uh, the debt limit, which was a lot of the talk in here uh, the last couple of days. Is there any way that um, the president would be willing, if the president meets with uh, congressional leadership on other matters between now and when uh, Secretary Yellen says we'll reach the, we'll reach the default point, uh, will he entertain discussions at all during meetings that may be on uh, some unrelated topic with members of Congress about debt limit negotiations, or will he just sort of say, no, we're not going to do this, we're going to, we'll discuss the topic at hand, but we won't talk about negotiating over the debt limit. So let me be clear, I don't have a, a, a meeting with leaders to, to read out at this time or to announce, but we've been really clear, we will not, uh, there will not be any negotiations over the debt ceiling. That we will not do that. It is their uh, constitutional duty. You think about how Congress has uh, has dealt with the debt ceiling for the past uh, several decades. Uh, it is their responsibility, uh, their con uh, constitutional responsibility, to act. And so, but more broadly speaking, at the start of this new Congress, I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again, uh, we're reaching out to all members uh, from, uh, from both sides of the aisle so they make sure that uh, we are built, they know who to reach out to when it comes to the Office of Ledge Affairs so that we continue to build those relationships. Again, in the past, there has been bipartisan cooperation to address the debt ceiling, and that's how it should be. It should not be used as a political football. 
Uh, that is not how we should be moving forward here. Our outreach is deliberate to ensure Congress knows that the debt ceiling must be addressed, again, without conditions. But always, uh, I'm not going to read out any specific uh, meetings or any, I uh, don't have anything else to read out about uh, the President meeting with leadership. Can I just follow up on something that uh, Courtney just asked, actually? The, uh, Senator Schumer says that the FAA administrator nomination is going to be a priority uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, are there, any, and I understand that's a priority for the president as well, do you have any other priority nominations that you would like uh, Senator Schumer and the Senate Democrats to take up uh, first? So let me just say we certainly welcome and appreciate Senator Schumer's uh, supportive comments this weekend, as you just uh, mentioned, and look forward to working together uh, to confirm Phil Washington specifically uh, as FAA administer an administrator. Let me just add that FAA, as, as I just said to Courtney, is a key agency with crucial sa safety mandate, and the president has nominated an experienced, qualified candidate who currently runs one of the busiest ports uh, airports in the world uh, uh, to lead the agency. And so we will continue to work with Senator Schumer, Senator Cantwell, and others to seek the swift, the swift confirmation. So clearly that is important uh, to us. Uh, look, we're going to continue to, uh, as we talk, as I talk about the swift, the swift confirmation, not just of the FAA administrator, but many uh, other crucial, high-qualified nominees to serve across uh, the administration. And we will be renominating re a number of officials in the upcoming weeks. And when we have updates to share, we certainly will, will share that. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Tia. Go ahead, Tia. Um, you mentioned Vice President Harris is going to speak up on the anniversary of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Is the administration going to announce any initiatives or policies of, for protecting abortion access, particularly to women who um, get their pills by mail? So let me just say the administration has taken actions with our limited authorities uh, to expand access to care. Uh, the president has issued two executive orders. Have you've heard uh, you've heard myself talk about it? Jen Klein uh, from the Gender Policy Council has been here to talk about the executive orders that the president has put forward. Uh, it is to safeguard access to abortion and contraception, ensure that everyone has access to health care free from discrimination, defend the the right to travel across state lines for medical care protect uh, the physical safety and security of clinics, providers, and patients. And uh, also, earlier this month, the FDA announced an independent evidence-based decision to expand access to medication abortion through telepath and at pharmacies. But we've been very clear. The President has been very clear. The Vice President has been very clear. The only way to restore the protections uh, of Roe is for Congress to pass a national law codifying the right to choose. No executive action will actually uh, deal with that is the issue that I just laid out. We need to codify Roe. And and that's what you're going to hear, uh, continue to hear from the president and from the vice president. Don't have any any other specific uh, actions than what I just laid out. Okay. Uh, who else? Todd. Uh, thank you. Um, on the president's visit to the border last week, is there any follow-up, any new uh, policies? Has he spoken with Governor Abbott? To, uh, to follow up on the governor's request? Don't have a, I don't have a, um, a conversation or a call to read out. I do want to say I've been asked about if we've seen an impact uh, from what the president uh, laid out a couple of weeks ago of what he's, uh, the actions that he was taking at the border. I want to say that we are uh, seeing some impact. The numbers of migrants arriving from those countries are low, and we look forward to sharing more once we have more data to go off of. Uh, additionally, the first individuals authorized to, to live and work legally in the United States under the expanded program started arriving uh, just last Tuesday, within five days after the launch of the program. Hundreds more have been vetted and approved for travel and can book a flight to the United States to arrive on time. But I want to be very clear, again, uh, we need Congress to take action. The President has done what he can has, uh, from, uh, from the, his, using his, uh, uh, from the, the executive, from, uh, from the White House. But, you know, what we're seeing is Congress still refuses to act. Uh, the President is going to use every to tools available, as you have seen him do these past two years, uh, to deal, to manage a mass migration event impacting the entire Western Hemisphere. But just 
only, but not only just one city, right? We've seen it just uh, across the board. So he's taking the steps. He's going to uh, uh, continue to take this very seriously when we think about the border security. Uh, but again, Congress needs to act. Republicans need to act. And uh, if they really care about this issue, this is an opportunity uh, to reach across the aisle and work with us on this. Okay. Oh my gosh. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Kareem. Yeah. I want to uh, reference an interview that President Biden did in mid-September with 60 Minutes. And in that interview, he chided former President Trump for having in his possession classified documents. He called it irresponsible. First of all, do you think it was proper for President Biden to comment on an ongoing DOJ investigation? So I'm going to say this. Uh, and I'm going to keep it really short today as it relates to this particular issue, as it relates to an ongoing uh, legal matter. I am going to refer you to Department of, Just uh, Department of Justice in, with the, that specific as it relates to uh, anything that you want to ask of us uh, about uh, this, uh, this legal matter. I would refer you to the White House Counsel uh, Office. I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to go I'm into further. I, and I just, I, I just commented. I just commented. We're moving on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I already answered your question. Go ahead. Well, I, I did. Well, it's your, it's your opinion. It's your opinion. It's your opinion. That is your opinion. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have two domestic questions today. First of all, can you just walk us through the administration's rationale for wanting South Carolina to be the first final state? and your reaction to the we've seen from Democrats in New Um Look, we have addressed this. The, Depart uh, the Democratic National Committee has addressed this. Uh, I'm just not going to go any further to what we've already shared uh, about this. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it to uh, the statements that we put out just a couple of weeks ago on the process. I'm just not going to dive into the process from here. Um, okay, then let me ask about the document issue then. Take another stab at it. but. Um, with, we don't know what's in these documents, but can the U.S. and is the U.S. working to reassure allies and partners that you can still participate in intelligence gathering, still be trusted with secrets? Is that, are those conversations that the President is having right now or that top of the administration officials are having, for example, Jake Sullivan in Israel? I, I'm going to say this. The President takes classified information seriously. You heard that directly from him. Uh, to classify documents seriously. You heard that directly from him last week. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it there. I'm not going to open this up uh, for discussion. We have answered many questions when it is as it is related uh, to, uh, to the documents. Uh, any specifics that's related to this, uh, 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 this, uh, this review, uh, this legal process, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. And any questions that you may have of us, I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House uh, uh, Counsel's Office. So I'll leave it there. OK. Go ahead, Joey. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the president is scheduled to meet on Friday with a group of mayors. Can you just give us a preview of that meeting, how many mayors, uh, what's on the agenda? Uh, what's the president's message? What, what does he hope to accomplish? With this? So as you know, he's going to, as you just mentioned, he's going to meet with uh, uh, mayors, bipartisan mayors who are attending the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, this is something that the president certainly is looking forward to, uh, to attending and to uh, to interact with the mayors who will be uh, who will be here. Don't have any more specifics as the list. Certainly, as we get closer, we will be sharing a list with all of you and more information uh, about uh, about the remarks that he be, will be giving. But again, it's, a bi it's, it's going to be bipartisan mayors, an opportunity, as the president has said, uh, and he has said during his Senate years uh, as a vice president and as, during the campaign and now as president, uh, he uh, looks forward to working in a bipartisan way and continuing to deliver for the American people. And that's what, uh, and that's what you're, you're, you'll probably hear from him uh, on Friday, but don't, have, don't want to get uh, beyond that. Uh, uh, Har Haryana, and way in the back. I'm going to go way in the back. Uh, it's been over a month since the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit take place, and uh, I would like you to give us an update what have been done so far in order to accomplish all the agreements and projects that are being agreed upon during the summit. No, it's a very good question. Look, President Biden was very pleased uh, with the summit and its outcome, including his personal engagement with many of his counterparts 
uh, that week. The summit was an effective demonstration of our renewed partnership with the region's governments, uh, business community, and civil, civil society, as well as the broader African diaspora. Uh, the President and uh, the African leaders worked together to define a shared global agenda and to set the stage for deeper cooperation and engagement in 2023 and beyond. So it, is, it was just the beginning, and we're looking to, uh, we're, we're truly looking to uh, continue those conversations, clearly on the staff level, uh, as we uh, continue throughout the year. How the president is feeling? Is he worried about those documents that were found, or is he did he somehow regret to to what he had done with those documents being found at his property? Is he uh, worried about that? Uh, first, I'm going to repeat what I've just said moments ago. Uh, he takes this very seriously when it comes to classified documents. When it comes to classified information, he was unaware. Uh, that the documents were there. You heard that directly from him, from the president, twice he spoke to this uh, just last week. Uh, and his team is fully cooperating uh, with this process, with the legal, this ongoing legal process. Uh, anything specific dealing with this, uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, with this issue, I would refer to the Department of Justice or the special counsel, uh, and I'll leave it there. Okay, I'll come, I'll come down. I'll come down. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the White House today put out this really sharply worded statement about the committee assignments, the oversight committee assignments. Um, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Representative Gosar, Representative Boebert getting these assignments on the oversight committee. The statement said, handing the keys of oversight to the most extreme MAGA members in the Republican caucus who promote violent rhetoric and dangerous conspiracy theories. Given this statement, does the White House view the oversight committee as even legitimate? So look. I've been very clear, and I just said this moments ago, the President uh, intends to work with both uh, parties in good faith, if they choose to, uh, and make more progress on, on behalf of the American people. He has said this. We will continue to say this. But unfortunately, to your point, Mary, uh, on some of these key committees, it appears that House Republicans have handed over the keys to the most extreme MAGA members of the Republican caucus. This is what we're seeing. Uh, from the other side of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. These are members who have promoted violent rhetoric and dangerous conspiracy theories, including suggesting violence uh, against political opponents, tra trafficking in anti-Semitic lies, and defending and downplaying a violent insurrection against our democracy. You all, many of you covered what we saw on January 6, 2021. And so Republican leaders should explain, they should have to explain, not us, they should have to explain why allowing these individuals to serve on these committees and come clean with the American people about the, the secret agreements, the secret deals that were made with these extreme MAGA, uh, MAGA extremists in, that are currently uh, in, in the House. And so that is something for them to uh, respond to. That, is some, that question goes to them. Sounds like you don't view the committee as very... I, I, I did not say that. I laid out, uh, I laid out what the President intends to do. I laid out um, what, uh, what unfortunately, what, what the actions that they have taken, how unfortunate it, it is uh, to basically hand over the keys to some of the most extreme uh, people uh, in, the, in the Republican Party, the MAGA, ultra-MAGA Republicans, and what they've done. But it is not for me to answer that question. It is for them to answer why is it that they chose to move in that direction. And can I just kind of follow up what you just said earlier about the president being surprised the documents were even there, that he said multiple times, you've said again, he was unaware that these classified documents were even in his garage, in his residence. Given that, given that, that you could actually just be surprised that documents were there, does that suggest to you, to this White House, that reform is needed? There needs to be changes for how classified documents are tracked through the U.S. government. I'm not, I'm not in a position to talk about reform or how this process should go forward. Uh, what I will say is this is something that's being reviewed by the Department of Justice. Uh, I would refer you to them. I would refer you to the special counsel. I'm just not going to go any further than that. Okay. Go ahead. Thank Ariel. you so much. Uh, I would have two questions. One is in Ukraine, one on the economy. On Ukraine, um, the Wall Street Journal and the German newspapers, the Deutsche Zeitung, are now reporting that the Germans won't provide tanks for Ukraine unless mm -hmm. the U.S. does exactly the same. So this seems to be a kind of deadlock situation here. What's the administration doing about it? So um, I was asked this question yesterday. When it comes to uh, uh, the U.S., we're in constant communication. 
uh, with Ukraine and will continue to provide them with what they need as they defend themselves against Russian aggression and against this brutal war uh, that we have seen uh, from Russia for almost a year now. Uh, but I don't have any new announcements to share of any types of security ass assistance to preview. Look, when it comes to uh, when it comes to other countries, the president believes that each country uh, can should make their own sovereign decisions on what steps of security assistance and what kinds of equipment they are able to provide Ukraine as, again, Ukraine defends itself against Russian aggression. So, for instance, we welcome Germany's recent announcement that they will send infantry uh, uh, fighting vehicles and a Patriot missiles battery system to Ukraine. We also support the decision by the UK over the weekend to send Challenger tanks to Ukraine. And we have seen incredible solidarity by nations around the world to support Ukraine. Uh, so, but it's not for us to speak to. That is their, each country's decision to make that, uh, to make their own sovereign decisions on this uh, as it relates to the U.S. We have been, as you know, uh, the largest provider of security assistance, of uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, we, will, uh, we will be standing by with the Ukrainian people and, uh, and helping them in any way that, they, that we can to defend themselves uh, until, you know, until uh, uh, throughout, throughout this process. But I don't have any announcements to make at this time. Um, the, the president has been like, quite optimistic <coughs> in his latest statements about you know, the possibility of a soft landing for the economy, but at the same time, we also have like m massive layoff announcements like Microsoft just today. Is this a uh, matter of concern for the White House? So that is something, um, as you know, that uh, we watch closely anytime there are reports of Americans losing their jobs. Uh, President Biden knows firsthand the impact of losing a job uh, and what that can have to your entire family. This is something that he knows and understands very well. I don't have a comment on specific moves announced by particular companies. As you know, we are, uh, we are very careful uh, from here talking about private companies, but more broadly speaking, layoffs remain near record lows according to job openings data. Uh, we found that we found out this week that 10 million new small businesses have been created since President Biden took office. I talked about this from this podium just yesterday. And similarly, third quarter GDP revision shows that the U.S. economy continues to grow and add jobs. We've also seen companies like T TSMC, uh, IBM, and Hyundai uh, announce or Hyundai announce uh, new investments doubling down on building technologies of the future, like chips and AI and electric vehicles in the U.S. Companies across the economy are continuing to grow and invest in the United States. Uh, but again, of course, this is something that we watch very closely. Okay, go ahead, Sabrina. Uh, thank you so much. And welcome back. Thank you. Uh, China reported that its economic growth fell to 3% last year and its population dropped for the first time since 1961. Uh, is the administration concerned about China's relative economic weakness and do you think that this raises the likelihood of an economic downturn in the U.S. and the, of the global economy this year? So look, I'm not going to uh, comment on uh, uh, how China handles its own economy, uh, but what we are focused on is our approach. Uh, we, which has uh, in, to ensure that uh, the United States economy remains resilient. And that's the president's focus. And when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about resilience in the face of global challenges and has helped spur a historic recovery. That is what we have seen uh, in this president's first two years uh, as uh, in the end of his administration. We'll continue our work to make progress on reducing prices and investing in our infrastructure, uh, manufacturing, and clean energy, energy economy. And so we, of course, monitor all global developments and will continue to stay in touch with our partners, allies, and key market sectors, including China. As you have, uh, have you have seen, Secretary, Secretary Yellen uh, is, in, is in China, and she's going to be meeting with China's Vice President uh, on one Wednesday, one Wednesday, which is today. Uh, and so, uh, again, she's there currently right now uh, in China. And there have been more allegations about Congressman George Santos's misuse of finances. Of course, this is in addition to him fabricating key details of his background while running for office, prompting more calls from both parties for his resignation. Just wanted to check back in. Does the White House think he should resign? So, look, we have we we've said this before, and I think I said it the the 
um, uh, probably the first few days of this of this new Congress uh, in this new year, which is it is up to uh, it is up to the Republican conference uh, who have to decide what they owe the American people. It is their decision to make uh, on on what it means, uh, what they see uh, as it relates to the terms of standards and service. Uh, they have to decide that. It is their conference. He's part of their conference, clearly. But uh, sadly, we have seen that they feel they owe the American people when it comes to standards by the actions that they have taken on this particular individual. Look, um, you know, uh, just looking at the committee that he has been assigned to when it comes to Biden's economic plan uh, and when it comes to the announcement that I made yesterday when it comes to small business, uh, we have seen a business application with over 10 million uh, new small businesses created under this leadership. And so the president takes that very seriously. He takes, uh, he takes um, build, making sure that we're building an economy from the bottom up, the middle out, very seriously. And you see that at every part of his policies and every economic policy that he pushes forward. Uh, but again, this is up to the Republican conference to show uh, what they think they owe the American people. So it's their decision to make. Okay. Thank you, Corrine. Just a quick follow-up on the economy uh, and job cuts. Um, Amazon announced 18,000 job cuts today. Microsoft announced 10,000 job cuts today. All these thousands of job cuts are coming on top of uh, tens of thousands of jobs being cut across the tech sector and across sectors uh, in corporate America. Obviously, the White House and the administration, like you just you know, pointed out a couple of minutes ago, still believes the economy is resilient, does not expect it to slip into a recession. Uh, but as we talk about mass layoffs and as the White House continues to point uh, a strong economy and overall recovery in the labor market, how do you expect some of these numbers uh, and some of these statistics to impact that recovery in the coming so months? So let me just be clear. When you talk, talk about recession and you talk about um, what we're seeing currently with the economy, these are the data points, right? This is the data points are showing uh, that this is not what we see, what, what the economy is currently, uh, to a pre-recession or a recession. I mean, that is what the experts are saying as well, and that's what the data points are proving. Uh, with CPI today, the consumer, uh, not CPI, the PPI today, uh, we're seeing that uh, inflation is actually indeed moderating, and a lot of that is connected to the president's economic policies. And so that is something that uh, we're going to continue to highlight. We're going to continue to point to the data, uh, not just our words, but that's what the data is showing. Look, um, again, as I mentioned to your colleague, I'm not going to comment specifically uh, uh, on, um, on what's currently happening with particular companies, with private companies. Clearly, we're closely monitoring, but like I said, the layoffs remain near record lows according to the job openings data. Again, looking at the data, looking at the numbers, uh, we found out, again, I talked about the small businesses, 10 million new small businesses uh, have been created since the president took office. That matters. Those data points also matter. The third quarter G GDP revision shows that the U.S. economy continues to grow and add jobs. Uh, so that's what I will point you to in answering your question as I just laid out. Uh, but again, we are seeing, an econ we're seeing the president's economic policy actually working, and I think that's important uh, as well. Is there more work to do? Always more work to do, and you hear that from us as well. So Good. there's no immediate concern from these uh, tens of thousands of What I'm saying is we're going to closely monitor this are uh, you know we are always keeping an eye on these things but but these are private uh, uh, these are private companies that are making decisions and we're just not going to comment and, and I'm in China, if I may, um, uh, you were talking about Secretary Yellen, um, you know, Treasury announced today that she's planning to go to China, um, uh, Secretary of State is planning to go to China, uh, the President uh, met with Xi in uh, Bali in November. Uh, clearly there is sort of momentum in, you know, uh, some sort of uh, rebuilding of ties between the two nations. Uh, going forward this year, should we expect the administration and the White House to perhaps tone down its rhetoric against China and really focus on rebuilding the relationship between the two I think economies? we've been very clear on our approach with China. That hasn't changed. We're looking for a competition, right? That's what we're, that's what we, that's how we see our relationship with China. Uh, and, uh, you know, that hasn't changed. It's not going to change when we walked in, when the President walked into the administration in 2020, in 20, uh, 21 is certainly not going to change in 2023. Good, Karen. I actually have an answer for you uh, on the question you asked me yesterday. <laughs> so I said, I said I would just up. say yes. Okay, uh, if you have a, a response. To this is the New Mexico, the New I Mexico. believe, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the allegations uh, here are horrifying and shocking, and it's a miracle that no one was hurt. 
Uh, the President has spoken uh, out repeatedly and emph emphatically about how our nation rejects violence uh, as a political tool. Uh, that is a bedrock principle of our democracy. It is important for leaders in both parties to reaffirm that particular, that particularly as we've seen an increase in violent rhetoric and political violence like we've seen most recently, again, in New Mexico. This administration has also emphasized the dangerous ways in which conspiracy theories and disinformation can lead some individuals to violence. Again, we urge leaders in both parties to reject lies and conspiracies. Uh, and finally, let me add, it's worth emphasizing that those intending to use violence as a political tool often choose firearms to intimidate and inflict carnage. And so that is why this administration has made strides to address firearms, but also has urged uh, more to be uh, done. Again, our, our, it's a horrifying and shocking, and uh, we're just, um, uh, we're just uh, glad that no one was hurt in this, in this uh, event. And if I can also ask you, I had asked you last Friday, and I know that there was a formal request from the WHCA uh, to have Richard Sauber come to the briefing and take questions. To follow up on that, would you commit to having uh, the White House Counsel come here and take questions? That is something that I would refer you to the White House Counsel's office. This is, they have been engaged with all of you. Uh, I know, again, they did a 45-minute uh, call with many of, if not you, many of your colleagues. Uh, somebody had that, somebody here had said 30, 30 minutes, but it was not. It was actually 45 minutes. They miscounted. Um, and so that was important. They will continue to engage with all of you. And so again, I would refer you to the White House uh, Counsel's Office uh, on this. And any specifics to uh, the ongoing legal matter, uh, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Did you pass along the request? I'm happy, I'm happy to pass it Thank along. You. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, one on NATO, one on uh, Belarus. Uh, there's an impasse between Sweden, Finland, and Turkey over Ankara's uh, demands related to uh, Sweden's and Finland's uh, NATO accession. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, you consider those demands uh, reasonable, and if not, uh, does the president uh, consider Turkey uh, a reliable NATO ally? And on Belarus, uh, a trial of a prominent Polish Belarusian activist, Andrzej Poczobut, has started in Belarus yesterday, and he's facing 12 years in prison for just criticizing uh, Lukashenko's regime. Can you comment on that? And is there anything that the U.S. can do to help uh, uh, to press uh, Belarus on this? So let me just say uh, that we do see Turkey as a, a reliable ally. Uh, so I'll answer that question that you just asked me. On e anything specific uh, about uh, uh, about the agreement and what's currently happening, uh, we would refer you to the Turkish government to speak on their own position. That's not something that I will do for them. I would not speak for them here. What I can say is that we have been a strong supporter of Finland and Sweden's applications for NATO membership and worked with the Senate to move quickly to ratify their applications. You saw, uh, you all uh, were here and saw Finland and Sweden's uh, leadership here with the president uh, not too long ago. We have welcomed the rapid ratifications by our allies, and we urge all remaining allies uh, to com complete their own ratification process as quickly as possible. To your question about Belarus, uh, so we condemn uh, the regime's blatant attempts to intimidate and harass uh, peaceful protesters, members of the democratic oppositions, journalists, unionists, activists, human rights defenders, and ordinary uh, Belarusians. These politically motivated trials are just the latest examples of the regime's effort to intimidate and repress those who seek justice, respect for human rights, and democratic uh, Belarus and a democratic Belarus, I should say. The respond, the, to respond to these human rights abuses, the State Department recently took action to impose visa restrictions on 25 individuals for their involvement in undermining Belarus's democracy. Uh, the U.S., the United States, stands firmly with Belarusian people and their democratic aspirations. I'm going to keep going. Thank you, Karine. Uh, just to be clear, my question is about procedures here at the White House and not about anything specific related to the DOJ investigation. Um, so I'm just wondering how this episode has prompted a review of the process in which staffers handle classified information. 
and how they are turned over to National Archives during a transition. And to be clear, I'm going to refer you to the, my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. They will be able to address that particular question. I'm just not going to address something that is even related to uh, an ongoing legal process. Why not? I mean, I'm having a hard time understanding why I just said, questions about we should, procedure. We should, and I just said, and I just said to you, the White House Counsel's Office will be able to address that question. Is President Biden satisfied with the current SOP of handling classified materials here and turning them over to National Archives? Again, I will refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. They are the they are the people who would uh, be able to answer that question about classified so information. Just to be clear, from this point on. Are you not going to be taking questions about the classified documents? I have been very clear over and over again. We are going to be prudent here. Uh, we're going to be consistent. This particular matter is being uh, is being looked at. There's a legal process currently happening at the Department of Justice, and I'm going to refer you to the Department of Justice on any specifics to this particular case and anything that has to deal with um, our what we're doing here, uh, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. And let me remind you, this is this is this is not a new process here. I, we've been doing this for the past two years. Anything that is related uh, to a, a legal uh, process, a legal matter, we refer it to the Department of Justice. There's nothing new in our process here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since so many of our questions have been referred to the DOJ and to the White House Counsel's Office, I'm sure you can understand that we're in sort of an information blackout where DOJ refers us to the special counsel. They're not holding any briefings. White House Counsel refers us to DOJ. So if you are not able to talk about this from the podium, would you invite a DOJ official to take our questions here? Uh, to the briefing. No, you would have to go to the Department of Justice. That is not, it, this is a, a legal matter that is currently happening at the Department of Justice. And the President has been very, very clear when it comes to these types of legal matters, when it comes to investigations, he's not going to interfere. Uh, he wants to make sure that we give back the independence that the Department of Justice should have when it comes to these types of uh, investigations. So certainly would not be bringing them here. Uh, so I would refer you to the Department of Justice. I, I just, I, I was just very clear. If you have any questions, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. They did a call for 45 minutes yesterday, speaking to many of you. I believe there were more than 200 people on that call. And so I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. But on questions that you should be able to answer here that shouldn't have to go to any other agency or entity, can you tell us if there's any sort of assessment that has been planned or launched to determine if national security has been jeopardized at all. Again, that's for the Department of Why Justice. Why is it a DOJ and, and question? It's, and let's be clear, it's not your decision to make on what I can or can't answer from here. What I'm telling you is that we are respecting the process. We are being prudent from here. There is an investigation currently happening. And when there is, when there are investigations that are happening, that the DOJ is, is uh, currently reviewing or looking at, we have been very consistent to say that you need to go to the Department of Are Justice. We with NSC or with any other intelligence Again, agency? Again, I would I refer you. I would. It's very. It's. It's very clear. Is I. I just laid out. There is no. There should be no confusion here. There. There is a legal process happening, and I would refer to the Department of Justice. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Can I just follow up on that? Uh, we've all reached out to the Department of Justice. A law enforcement official tells NBC News the Justice Department has not told the White House that it cannot talk about the facts underlying the special counsel investigation into classified documents. So trusting you've received that same information, understanding the desire to be prudent, then why, why can't you speak about the underlying facts? We've been very clear when it comes to even underlying facts, when it comes to specifics, when it comes to something that is under the purview, that is that the Department of Justice is looking at, especially legal matters, investigations, we do not comment from here, Peter. That Got has it. been consistent. So We've been that, very Bauer, consistent. Who, Bob Bauer, who represents the president's personal attorney over the weekend, said that one of the reasons why, and Ian Sams, your colleague who represents, who speaks on behalf of the special counsel at the White House, um, spoke to this in some form yesterday, but he said one of the reasons why they shouldn't reveal uh, further details right now was regular ongoing public disclosures also pose the risk that as further information develops, answers provided on this periodic basis may be incomplete. When the White House did release a statement, the President spoke out on January 9th, 
the risk of incompletion was a function of the White House's decision not to share all the information it knew, in fact, because we knew on uh, November 2nd, and the first discovery was made. We knew the second discovery was made on December 20th. So there's a risk of incompletion, but will you concede that it's the White House that has been incomplete in its provision of information when it did choose to speak out publicly so, uh, on January 9th? My colleague actually dealt with this question on the call yesterday on the White House he Counsel's made, he Office. Made the same point as about you, the as risk you, of incompletion. and I would refer you to the White House Counsel's then Office. Then may I make? Then is the White House having any conversations internally about finding some? much the same way John Kirby has spoken on behalf of national security issues at this podium as your colleague, as their representative. Is there someone, is the White House in talks right now to find someone either outside the White House or internally who can speak on behalf of the White House representing the special counsel office within the White House from this podium or any of those I would, talks? I would refer you to the White House counsel's office. Well, but you're the communications, I, you, you I run would, communications, I, so I'm I, you as a communications matter having, we, playing there is those you, existing. Peter, you have spoken to my colleague who did, again, a 45-minute call with all of you answering questions but about... If you would acknowledge it's on background, that Kareem, not on the record until the call ends, that means the American people can't see it in public. So we're asking, will there be a representative many, but, who would speak on camera and but, see it in public? But his, the call was indeed, he was quoted, it was in, in papers, it was on networks. Correct, but because they can't witness it happening live, Americans don't get the same transparency into this back and forth. I'm I think, asking, I think. Some, is the White House having a conversation? Peter, with, Peter. This is just with respect. You guys brought John Kirby in. I'm asking but, if that conversation Peter, exists. the fact that he spoke to all of you you reporters who report on this, and then you all reported on it back to the American people, I believe that is transparency. I believe that he shared information, he answered your questions that you believe that the American people wanted to hear, and he answered those questions. So and he took, he took 45 minutes to do that. Anything, anything else that you have on this, Peter, I would refer to the White House counsel. Peter, I'm not, I just we just went back. Peter, having a conversation about adding I, a Peter, member to the staff Peter, to speak publicly on the Peter, staff. Peter, I just, I now. actually just answered that question. I said we have someone currently, So that right? means no. We have someone currently who answered your questions for 45 minutes on a call yes. and took your questions. Yes. Took your questions about this particular issue. Correct. He will continue to do that. He will continue to engage with all of you right, on this issue, on this legal process that's currently happening from the White House Counsel's office. After that, Peter, I don't have anything else to share. Go ahead, go ahead. On the, go ahead, um, last question. Okay. On the um, debt limit, I know that the White House says that you're not going to negotiate with Republicans on sort of, you know, concessions or, or anything tied to it. Does that mean that the White House, the President, is, is dissuading other Democrats on the Hill from engaging in those conversations and those negotiations with Republicans? What we've been very clear about is that in the last administration, the debt ceiling was dealt with three times, three times in a bipartisan way. And so that's what the President wants to see. That is a, that is a, it is their um, uh, constitutional duty for Congress to deal with this issue. And again, it's been done in a bipartisan way, and we uh, should not put the full faith and credit uh, of, uh, of, of our country and uh, 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 take it uh, hostage, right? We should not do that. And so that's what we've been very clear about. It's been done in a bipartisan way the last three times under, three times under the last uh, administration, and that's what we want to see. So just to be clear, Democrats and Republicans in a bipartisan way reach an understanding, reach an agreement as it relates to the debt limit. The president what would we, accept we've that. We've been, we've been very clear. We, there should not be any negotiations around here. We should not be <coughs> stepping around uh, dealing with the debt ceiling. We've been incredibly clear here. Uh, this is an issue that is a constant, the, the basic, the basic duties of Congress to take care of, to handle. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be continue to say that. We're going to be very clear. It should be done without conditions. Thank you, everybody.